On This Week in Enterprise Tech, everything you wanted to know about the Microsoft announcements, plus Ixia drops by to give us application and threat testing. Twyatt, on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt, This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 126, recorded January 26, 2015. Microsoft, Ixia, and threat testing. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by PagerDuty. PagerDuty decreases alerting noise for IT operations and developers to ensure that the right engineers are notified at the right time. Increase your uptime and sign up for a 14-day free trial at pagerduty.com slash twit. And by ldproducts.com, the ink and toner experts. Shop online at ldproducts.com for high-quality products at discount prices. For 10% off ink and toner cartridges plus free shipping, excluding OEM, go to ldproducts.com slash twit and enter the offer code TWIT. And by Ring Central, the business phone system that's in the cloud. Stop using that clunky, hard-to-use, and expensive PBX. That's what we did. Try Ring Central now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I'm not guiding you alone. I've got a cast of cohorts that I think you need to meet now, starting with Mr. Brian Chi, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu, Hawaii. Brian, how are things for the geek in paradise? Oh, the geek in paradise is slammed under the day job. But the InfoWorld top techs of the year have been posted. Congratulations to IOSafe and to Fluke for nabbing spot number 31 and number 32. Fantastic. Speaking of spots, I must be seeing them because I'm not joined by Curtis Franklin right now. He was actually caught up in that big stormageddon, icemageddon. I'm not sure what we're calling it. He'll be a little bit late. He'll join us later in the show. But uh, taking his place, Atlee, is Mr. Lou Maresca, a senior software developer over at Microsoft. Lou, thanks for jumping in and uh, and you know taking the huddle here. Yeah, no problem. Love to be here, guys. Well, gentlemen, of course, Lou's going to be here because we're going to be talking a little bit about Microsoft. They had a few interesting announcements last week. And then we've got a special guest. We're going to be bringing in a security expert from a security company that you may have known with four letters, starting with an I, sounding like Ixia. Well, I just gave it away. Well, we're going to be talking about threat assessment and performance assessment. There is no better company. But before that, hey, gentlemen, what do you say we do some blips? Let's go ahead and start it off. This first one is a TCP dump at the pump. Researchers at Rapid7, a security research firm, have discovered a vulnerability in the automated tank gauge, or ATG, the device that monitors storage tanks at fueling stations around the world. H.D. Moore, Rapid7's chief research officer, explained in a blog post on the company's website that an attacker with access to the serial port of an ATG can spoof fuel level alarms or lock stations entirely out of their pumping network. While the attack shouldn't be a problem because it usually requires physical access to the serial port on an ATG, Rapid7 found over 5,800 ATGs worldwide, 5,300 in the United States, that had their serial ports mapped to a real IP address over TC port 10001, of course, none of which had a password protect. We can now add gas stations to the Internet of Things that shouldn't be on the Internet. Big blue goes pink. Today, IBM announced that they will be revamping their divisional charts worldwide, uh, combining several divisions, creating new, entirely new ones, dropping a few altogether. Restructuring is an attempt to make the company more closely resembling the big data cloud services business intelligence company that IBM has become, rather than the old world hardware and software services model. Restructuring is a response to 11 quarters of negative growth, and we reportedly see IBM dumping about 118,000 of its workers before it's over. Well, smart sensors may get you a homeowner's insurance discount. 
While this story broke back in 2013, with State Farm partnering with ADT and Lowe's for homeowners insurance for home monitoring systems, it looks like more insurance companies are jumping onto the bandwagon. Tim Arona, the VP of Risk Management for Pure Insurance, is speculating that as more and more smart devices like the Nest emerge on the market with items like smart locks, monitored smoke detectors and thermostats, along with the webcams, could be by 2019 a regular part of your homeowner and renter's insurance package of discounts. He also speculated that these features could also make your home a little more valuable as they become a distinguishing feature from your neighbors. So make sure it's monitored and you could possibly get as much as 20% like I do. The next wave of 802.11ac devices is here and Cisco thinks you want their version. With the arrival of Wave 2 802.11ac wireless gear that supports 7 gigabits per, se uh, per second of connection speed, Cisco has announced multi-gigabit technology that will enable their Switch customers to support the bandwidth needs of the new standard. Cisco will be following the N base T spec, which will allow 1, 2.5, 5, and 2 and 10 gig connections all from the same port, all over the same Cat 5e or Cat 6 copper currently on premise. As an added bonus, adopters of Cisco's multi-gigabit tech can install the new cards in existing 4500E and 3850 chassis, letting customers support the needs of Wave 2 access points while leaving the rest of the switch as is. Chromebooks teaching winning to California students. When you think about it, education deals with some of the largest enterprise networks in the country, so it's not a surprise that the same thin client revolution that's changing how business is done on corporate networks is penetrating the classroom. Crack networking reporter Curtis Franklin spoke with Kristen Wright, an educational specialist with the Desert Sands Unified School District of California. Three years ago, they started a pilot program to bring inexpensive Chromebooks into the classroom. Today, they have more than 20,000 devices, and that's a single school district. But it's not just about the teachers and administrators. Enterprise divisions from most of the major manufacturers are well aware of the potential in education markets and are marking to are making moves to become the, the vendor for thin solutions catered for schools. With seats in the millions, education has become a definite growth area. Rumor has it that Google Fiber, available in North Carolina, will be announced soon with installations to start this April. Digital Trends is breaking the news that local officials in Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte received a notice to set aside January 28th and 29th as a potential date for this announcement. It should be pointed out that Google is not saying exactly what the content of the announcement will be, but it's probably going to be Google Fiber since it doesn't look like Google is ready to do citywide Wi-Fi yet. The anonymous source spoke to WRAL TechWire backing up this rumor with the fact that Google created a Google Fiber Corporation in North Carolina on December 2nd. Good times and such a move would obviously be very welcome to the residents. With much of the automated, automotive news out of CES 2015 being dominated by self-driving cars, it's no surprise that Ford Motor Company is betting that the future of the automobile will be tied to advanced communications technology. Ford has opened a research center in Palo Alto, California, smack dab in the heart of the Silicon Valley. The center will be tasked with developing systems that will enhance, quote, connectivity, mobility, and autonomy, unquote. Ford joins Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Toyota, Nissan, and VW, all of which have their own research centers dedicated to the exact same thing. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be speaking with Lou Maresca about Microsoft's announcements. But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, the tech that we use in the enterprise gets more and more reliable with every generation. Servers fail over, switches route around outages, and storage has redundancies for redundancies of redundancies. But no matter how sophisticated our tools may become, things still break when we least expect them to. And that's why we've got PagerDuty as a sponsor of the Twiat Riot. PagerDuty is an operations performance platform that delivers visibility and actionable intelligence to help increase the uptime of your apps, your servers, websites, and databases. PagerDuty connects all of your systems into a single view, allowing you to see critical events across all your monitoring tools. It's an essential service if your business needs your software and services to always be up. It has over 100 ready-to-use integrations, including Nagios, New Relic, Keynote, App Dynamics, or you could roll your own with PagerDuty's APIs, and you can customize it to fit how you and your team work, regardless of location or size. Oh, here's how it works. When there's an incident, and there will be one, 
PagerDuty will first look through all your monitoring tools, filters, and deduplicate the alerts. And then only then will it alert the proper staff. This reduces noise and false alerts and makes sure that the only actionable alerts are delivered to the people that need to hear it. After reducing the noise, PagerDuty checks on-call schedules and personalized alerting preferences to automatically alert the right team and team member. Those alerts are dispatched by automated phone calls, SMS, email, and push notifications. PagerDuty is distributed across multiple data centers and multiple hosting providers, so your people will never miss an alert. If alerts are missed, PagerDuty will automatically escalate issues to another team until it's responded to. All of this means one thing. You can resolve incidents on the go and live your life even when you're on call. Of course, PagerDuty isn't content to just tell you about problems. Its analytic tools will also identify common problems, allowing you to proactively make system improvements and prevent future outages. They're trusted by thousands of companies, including Microsoft, GitHub, Boeing, Nike, Pinterest, and Box. Get the right engineers on the right problem at the right time. Visit pagerduty.com slash twit and sign up for a free 14-day trial. And for as little as $19 a month, you can increase your uptime with PagerDuty. And when you sign up for a new account, you'll also get a free t-shirt. That's pagerduty.com slash twit. pagerduty.com slash twit. And we thank PagerDuty for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Let's get to it. Uh, we did have a few interesting announcements from Redmond uh, last week about Windows 10 and a few other interesting tidbits out of the Microsoft campus. We've brought Lou Maresca on, a longtime contributor to This Week in Enterprise Tech. In fact, Lou, people may not remember this if, if they weren't with us at the beginning. I think you were on episode two or three. You were you were there like in the single digits. Yeah, I was, uh, I was actually in studio too, which is kind of impressive. Yeah, it was, it was one of those weird things. It just, it just happened, it was perfect. You were on vacation, you said, hey, let me do some twiet. Now, mm. Windows 10 was released. Let's talk a little bit about the pricing because this has been a source of a lot of speculation. A lot of people have different ideas of what exactly Microsoft meant by it being free to people who are running Windows 7 8.1 or Windows Phone 8.1. What what's the official word? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that was a little bit confusing because Terry Meyerson talked about that you get a free upgrade and it's going to be considered uh, a lifetime support and all that stuff. And it was really kind of confusing what he was saying because people were thinking business, people were thinking consumer. So I think one thing to kind of take, take into account here is that when he was talking about a free upgrade, he was talking about uh, for consumers. And he's basically saying for a year when Windows 10 is uh, announced, are released for one year will allow you to upgrade for free, no strings attached. Uh, and so that, again, that's only for consumers. Um, and so that's really what the Windows as a service kind of statement kind of was veered towards uh, more consumer based or small business based type things. Now, from a business perspective, I'm sure that they haven't really talked about licensing for that yet. So there's not really any clear aspects of that, but they do have what we were talking about, the enterprise uh, cloud suite that they, were, they had uh, debuted last year. Uh, and that might come into account when it comes to that pricing as well. Yeah, I, I, I've, I heard on the forums there were people saying, okay, so I can upgrade for a year and then they start charging me a subscription. It's, no, no, it's they want to move as many people over to 10 as possible, as quickly as possible. So they're saying for that first year, if you want, it's a free upgrade. After that, we'll, we'll talk. But uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about this ECS. It's the enterprise cloud. Uh, Chibert. You've been playing around a little bit with uh, with this, right? I mean, they released it in December, and the whole idea was that for seven to twelve dollars per user per month, you basically get a, a license for the Windows Enterprise Edition for x86 laptops and desktops with screens smaller than 10.1 inches. That includes a license for Windows Enterprise VDI through Windows to Go that will let users use a prepackaged, corporate-approved OS image on a thumb drive. Uh, you've practiced with that. I mean, I, I know you've been playing with that tech for over a year now. Uh, is that ready for prime time? Uh, would, is this a big announcement? Uh, with the running it from a thumb drive is basically their Windows to go technology. And even though I thought it was a great tech, I love it. I've used it in a couple of different places. It never got a lot of traction. Um, now, as far as the VDI um, images and so forth, there is, it's complicated enough, the licensing, that there's actually a flow chart mm. on what you can and can't use. And it all depends upon whether it's an approved or unapproved operating system, like whether it's Mac OS X or full Windows machine, those types of licenses change that it, 
from when you're on, say, an iPad or an Android. Um, so what I really would suggest is contact your licensing, pe your, your sales rep, and get a copy of that licensing flowchart so you know what you're diving into. I actually did a project, uh, a VDI project, and I actually got a little surprised that I had to buy a whole bunch of what are called SA licenses uh, in order to run it off-premise. So the licensing, whether you're on-premise or off-premise, is actually a little different, and you really need to go and Courtesy. grab a copy of that flowchart. Yeah, set them up. Fantastic. All right, uh, Chibert, sorry. Um, the w uh, let me go back to you, Lou. So uh, we know that a few things are included in ECS. We've got uh, OneDrive for Business. We've got Azure Active Directory. We've got MDOP, Desktop Optimization Suite. We've got Intune MDM, and we've got Office. But maybe you could help us sort of straighten up all that licensing. What's what's your breakdown of what ECS provides and what does it cost? Yeah, so like you said, it was a twelve to I mean, seven to twelve dollars per month. It includes, like you said, Windows Enterprise Edition licenses for devices that are smaller than ten inches. Um, you have a license to access Enterprise Windows Enterprise via VDI, um, and that's Windows the Windows to Go feature, like uh, uh, Cheaper was talking about. And there's also some current features that are already in there. Like you were saying, there's Active Direct, Act, uh, Azure Active Directory for identity management, OneDrive for business, uh, MDOP for desktop optimization, Intune uh, for your mobile your mobile device management, uh, and also some of the offices on all devices. And you're supposed to be getting unlimited VDI licensing for it too. So that's kind of what's supposed to be included with ECS. And again, that might be you know kind of in integrated with some of the Windows 10 type of upgrade features as well. Right. Let's take a tiny step forward, Lou. One of the buzz terms that we've heard over the last week is WAS, Windows as a Service. Now, a, a lot of enterprise people have, have heard blank as a service for a while, probably for the last four years. Everything has become as a service. What does it mean Windows as a service? Because there are people who are worried that this just means, oh, Microsoft wants to ding me monthly or yearly. It, it's actually different the way that it was announced. Can, can you break that down? Yeah, so like one of the things that Satya kind of talked about during his talk was, you know, con continuous stream of innovation. And that's really what Microsoft's trying to move to is Windows being as a service, meaning we're going to constantly service you and provide you with key upgrades as you go along. And it's really kind of geared more towards consumers or small businesses who want to kind of keep up to date on the latest and greatest. And that's kind of the key is businesses doesn't, don't necessarily want to do that. And so they have two mo modes that they basically moved into for businesses, which is the opt-in and the opt-out mode. And the opt-in mode is kind of the fast moving consumer based type model that businesses might want to get into where they want to have the latest and greatest all the time. They might not have some legacy applications that they have to really worry about. Or they have what they call the lockdown or mission critical environments, which basically only receive like security and critical updates. And those both models are kind of supported in this new new wave as software as a service or Windows as a service. So that people are kind of worried, oh, well, I'm going to have to pay for this, blah, blah, blah. It's really just a term to talk about our releasing structure, I guess you could say, uh, going forward. Um, and I'm, I'm going to guess that it's going to basically be integrated to the service pack model, the upgrade model, where we don't necessarily call them maybe... I don't think we're going to call them service packs anymore. They're going to merely, again, be called just a continuous stream of innovation, whether it come down from Windows Update or the store or whatever, however they come down. But that's kind of the term, what its main, main, main meaning is supposed to be. I, I like the idea of constant updates, but uh, we've got Dr. Morbius and Rorks and another, a few other people in the chat room who are saying, I refuse to pay a subscription for an OS. I just won't do it. I, I want to own the OS, and then of anything I pile on top of it, I could make subscription-based, but I, that, that idea of the, the boot becoming tied to me paying every month just is not attractive. That's not what's happening, right? That's not Windows as a service. Let's be clear about that. It's, it's just for how we improve the OS? Yeah, I think from what, what we're basically learning so far is that's exactly what it is. It's supposed to be just an idea of providing you with faster updates and faster services than what has been done before. And so now you have these what they call patch Tuesdays, and they just kind of patch security updates. But what this is going to be is more of streaming of, of new features now. So now you're going to get the updates and the new features, but you're also going to get the new stuff, the new features, some of the new apps, some of the new, uh, you know, whether it be some of the no, new notification centers or new updates to the actual OS. You know, it'll allow them to kind of innovate faster than they did before. And that's kind of what the idea is behind it. Right, right. Chibert, what about that? Why, why make this shift from this idea of patching? So patching is just, we found a hole, we, we plugged it, to, 
No, it's now it's now streaming. It's a service. It's something that's going to be continually improved. What's Microsoft trying to do here? Well, what they're trying to do is they're trying to not have vulnerabilities sit out in the wild for long periods of time. They want to be able to go and um, fix those issues very, very quickly. Now, what I should point out is the subscription um, methodology actually is actually a lot of time, a lot of that emphasis is being pushed by the consumers because the CFOs, our, our friendly bean counters, want to have more control over the um, cost of the uh, workstations. So by going to a subscription basis where everything's included, updates and everything, um, they, have more, they have a more predictable um, cost center. Whereas they, what CFOs have been complaining about is that massive, massive cost that the IT groups are saying where you actually ship in, you know, you have to buy volume license. You have to go and do all this thing. It costs you a ton of money to go and do the upgrades. Uh, CFOs are the ones driving this. They want to have um, a more all-inclusive cost without all these hidden costs that they've been um, dealing with um, in the past years. Lou, it's gone all Lord of the Flies in the chat room, and there's still people who are saying, wait a minute, no, 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 no. So if I don't pay a subscription fee, that means that now I have to deal with vulnerabilities. Let's, let's, let's settle this, because uh, I'm unclear myself. If I decide to buy once, and I don't want to pay a subscription fee, does that mean that I don't get security patches? No, Microsoft, especially for consumer base, they're not going to leave you out to dry. I mean, this is the whole idea behind Windows, is they're going to provide this, this constant critical update to any type of service or application or kernel type thing that or OS type thing that you're going to need for the future. So I, you know, this is not something they're going to be doing for you. So to, so to be clear, that's not something they're going forward. Now this new program, I'm sure they'll be cleared up in the coming months and they'll be more clear on what that means when the software windows as a service. But as it means right now, it just means of a new release kind of structure for windows as a, as a, as a feature base. Right. So, okay. So let's break it down. It's, it's not like Windows is saying, well, if you don't pay us, you're going to be vulnerable. Windows is saying, Microsoft is saying, we will update your Windows, but if you do the subscription basis, you will get all the features as they're updated throughout the year. That's, right. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. Yep. That's okay. correct. Now, uh, Cheever, let's, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, that actually sounds more attractive because it's going, it's going to satisfy the people who are saying, oh, oh well, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to pay a continual subscription. And it's going, to, it's going to satisfy the people who say, I will pay X amount of dollars per year in order to make sure everything is up to, to snuff. Everything is great. I have all the latest features. I have all the latest releases. Do you see a converging of those two eventually or will there always be those two camps? Well, I think there's always going to be at least a little bit of two camps um, because small businesses tend to like having a one-time purchase. And, you know, I, I, I hear that in the, from the chat room. Uh, but when you start talking about large number of licenses, um, say you're going from Windows 7 to Windows 8. So a lot of people have been really delaying that because they don't want to have to pay that giant um, wad of money in one time. So the spin I'm putting on this that I think I'm reading into it is that, say, for instance, Windows 10 comes out and under the old format, it might be, oh, say we're going to, you know, the equivalent of Service Pack 2 that used to cost money. Uh, under this new program, it's not. Um, time will tell on how accurate my, um, my spin is, but... That's the type of thing that CFOs have been complaining about. It's that big wad of cash they have to fork over in order to stay um, current. And they do kind of want to stay current because that's where the vulnerabilities come from. When you can go and change out to something new, they have the ability or at least the opportunity to go and fix a lot of the intrinsic problems that might exist, say, like in what we had in XP. All right. All right, Lou, let me, let me uh, have you run down some of the Windows 10 killer features and, and specifically angle this towards the enterprise. Mm -hmm. If I am an IT manager and I'm looking at my 10,000 seat enterprise network and they're all running a mix of mm -hmm. Windows 7 or the newer stations, Windows 8, why do I decide to push them to Windows 10? <laughs> so, I mean, there's there's a whole slew of new features from device management capabilities where they're basically extending like the built-in mobile device management um, for traditional, not only traditional desktops and laptops, but mobile first kind of cloud first scenarios. Um, they have a new app store to basically allow um, the use of like single, uh, basically business apps as well. 
Um, it's a unified store, so there'd be some there'll be some purchasing around large organizations and, re, and reclaiming and reusing licenses, that kind of thing. Um, there's also the approach around uh, the multi-factor uh, authentication models that they've actually increased or bettered for using uh, identities across de devices and apps and sites and improving res resistance to breaching and thefting and phishing. Um, and so there's a lot of factors into that. Um, they also have the idea around, you know, right now with consumers use BitLocker, will helps protect data um, that resides on devices. But what they've also added to Windows 10 is the ability as an additional layer to protect uh, data and containers are around separate applications and file levels that kind of spans across devices, it spans across you know USB sticks and PCs and tablets and services and so on, and they can basically do encryption and secure that data as well. Uh, and then there's also um, the uh, Windows 10 also provides organizations with like the two, more tools to to secure and control over their VPN access. So there's there's a ton of extra features from a business or enterprise standpoint that are kind of stuck in there. There's also the really flashy stuff that we talked about, like the new start menu, start menus back rather than just the start screen, but you can go to the tablet mode, kind of brings you back into that old uh, model, as well as you know the Xbox One and game streaming and messaging across devices. Uh, also, the game DVR for Windows games, where you can basically, you know, whether it's a, a, a Steam um, app, uh, um, game or it's an Xbox game, it basically allows you to kind of do DVR of that game uh, that last 30 seconds. There's a new uh, uh, Maps application, uh, which is a new Universal app, and we'll talk about when you ver what Universal apps later. Uh, there's a new Clock and a new Calendar flyout. There's a new Store. Again, we talked about it for business apps as well as, you know, they're kind of unifying the store amongst all devices. Um, there's a new action center to the right, your notification center. It's very close to the Windows phone version of it. And, of course, uh, there's a whole slew of new modern, what we call universal apps that are coming out, whether it's Office or, um, again, Maps or, you know, any of the, uh, the Bing offerings that are out there. They're all universal. So there's a, a ton of stuff that's coming into play when it comes to Windows 10 features. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that I will say is that I've, I've actually been using Windows 10 for the last two months. I've got it on one of my production boxes back in my lab. And... I like it. I actually really like it. It's got a lot of the stability that I really liked out of Windows 8, that the kernel is is much improved. It deals with a lot of the things that Windows 7 kind of balked at, but it does feel closer to Windows 7 than it did to Windows 8. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about that uniform app, that uh, unified app, this idea that I can have an application that automatically knows what it's running on. Because one of the key features of Windows 10 is that you can go from a desktop to a laptop to a convertible hybrid to a mobile device, and the app experience will change to suit that device, but it should still feel the same. I think this is something that Microsoft wanted with Windows 8, but they did it with a really ham-fisted way and nobody liked it. Why Why should people like it now? So the concept here is, is really for developers where it gives the ability to kind of build all the business logic and underlying logic, all their, uh, all their um, you know, basic secret sauce to their applications to build it in one spot and be able to share it across all your devices, including potentially even Xbox, tablet, smartphone. And then what you can do is then you slap a, uh, the ability to p basically determine the UI based on your form factor. So the concept of form factor now comes into play. And then you can have X amount of different form factors and determine what the UI is supposed to look like for those different form factors. But the underlying logic itself doesn't really change. So now you're kind of pushing all of the effort onto the designers and the UI, uh, UX developers to kind of deal with kind of the different form factors rather than the entire application having to kind of rewrite it for every platform. And that's a huge offering. If you ever talk to developers today, it costs a lot of money to basically kind of build applications, whether, you know, on the different APIs and different SDKs that are available for all the different platforms. So that's where kind of universal apps comes into play. And they've made it a lot simpler. And it, it's I think it's going to be a big, a huge deal for a lot of companies, a lot of corporations. Yeah. Lou, unfortunately, we, we're kind of running out of time. There were two other things that I really wanted to talk about, about Microsoft Surface Hub and also about, uh, of course, the HoloLens. Uh, how about this? Uh, are, are you available tomorrow evening, Lou? Let's do it, yeah. I, 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 I'd love to have you on Padre's Corner. We can continue this discussion because those technologies are a bit more consumer-oriented, but uh, I, I want to give people time to have a rundown on <clears throat> some of the, the, the design and the tech that actually went into those, those, uh, those products. 
Yeah, definitely. And one of the things I wanted to point out really fast is there's also the new Spartan browser engine coming into play. And I want to make sure everyone's clear, especially from an enterprise space. There are basically kind of two browser engines kind of hand in hand, side by side, that'll be in Windows 10. That'll be the Trident engine, the original one, and the, what they call the new Edge or render, the new Spartan rendering engine. And that will allow you to not only... Um, hand in hand be able to have your old applications that use ActiveX controls and some of the old IE features still available in this kind of like what they call legacy mode or the old Trident mode, as well as be able to go in kind of the edge mode, the new rendering engine. Um, and so that that kind of allows you to still super uh, basically have your applications hand in hand side by side and be able to support them. And the browser will actually seamlessly switch back and forth between the two based on what you're using. And so that's a really key thing for enterprise. I wanted to make sure I slipped that in there under the covers. Lou Maresca, Senior Developer Lead at Microsoft. We want to thank you for being part of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Folks, if you want to continue this discussion, get some uh, behind-the-scenes information about these Microsoft releases, join us tomorrow for Padres Corner, 7.30 p.m. PST, here at live.twit.tv. Until then, Lou, could you please tell the folks at home where they can find you and your work? You bet, Lou M.M. on Twitter uh, and Lou M.M. on About Me, and as well as all of my work that I do during my daily job is on uh, crm.dynamics.com. And you'll also see Lou on Coding 101 on Thursday. So this is kind of a Lou-centric week, folks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lou Maresca, we thank you for being here and uh, get back to work. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, guys. Uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking to a representative from Ixia who wants you to know a few things about application and threat testing. But before that, let's take a moment to thank the second sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's LD Products. Let's face it, you're going to need to print. That means you need paper, you need toner, you need ink. It's the lifeblood of the modern office. Some things just need to be printed. Some things just work better when it's in front of you. It's a fact of modern life, even in the electronic era. So in today's paperless office, you've got two choices. You can pay a lot for your printing supplies, be confused when you buy them, and never really know if you're going to get the right supplies for your printers, or you can go to ldproducts.com. You don't go to the car dealership to buy gas, so why go back to the printer manufacturer to buy ink and toner? LD Products offers a quality alternative at a fraction of the cost. Some products are up to 75% off of OEM. They've been in business for 15 years, since 1999, and they're a BizRate customer certified and a Google-trusted store, shipping over 1 million orders a year. And they get it. They know that you're not an ink or toner expert. They don't expect you to be. That's why they have real people who are experts and who will treat you with respect seven days a week from their U.S.-based call center. Worried about getting the wrong product? Well, don't. All their products are risk-free with a, with a two-year, 100% customer satisfaction guarantee. That means you can return any product for any reason. But LD isn't just about good prices, great service, and an excellent return policy. Buying LD brand cartridges helps the environment by keeping oils, plastics, and waste out of our landfills. Plus, their call center, warehouse, and headquarters operate from a 110,000-square-foot Platinum LEED certified building in Long Beach, California. LD Products has your printer needs covered. Remanufactured, compatible, and brand name products. To get 10% off ink and toner plus free shipping, excluding OEM, go to ldproducts.com slash twit and enter the offer code twit. That's ldproducts.com slash twit and the offer code twit. And we thank LD Products for their support of this week in enterprise tech. We welcome to the show a man who, uh, well, he spends most of his time in darkness staring at security screens and feeds of traffic. It's Mr. Phil Trainer from Ixia. Phil, thank you very much for joining us on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Great to be here, Padre. Uh, Phil, if you could tell the folks at home, uh, who are you? I mean, I, I, I've heard about you, I've seen your work, but what do you do for Ixia? Well, essentially, I work in the product group in apps and security, and really what we do is we create products that help people gain insights into really what's going on on a security level and a performance level as what's happening on the enterprise network. All right. Okay. Now, I, I, I'm going to be I'm going to be my audience because my audience is skeptical. My audience just kind of poo poo. They say, "Wait a minute, that sounds like a lot of buzzwords. <laughs> That's a, that sounds like a, a bunch of, of words that you're supposed to say because your PR people gave you stuff." What what does that mean? So when you look at a network, when you assess a network, what are you building to make that network better? 
really uh, under the hood uh, network is users creating traffic. And if you're okay. a security device, then you have to uh, perform like regular expressions and look at this network traffic at a very granular level. And one of the things that we do is we expose kind of the dirty secrets of security devices. And that is the fact that the greater the complexity of the traffic and the more volume of the traffic, the less effective security devices are. And we really find that uh, uh, the point in which security devices begin to fail because of the complexity of not only the attacks, but the complexity of the traffic as a sift through. This is actually something that we've covered on Twiat before. We've had uh, both Steve Gib Gibson and Raphael Mudge come on and tell us that one of the, uh, the things that they're seeing is the rise of DDoS attacks that aren't just a nuisance, but they're actually a strategy to, to get the security appliances on the network that they're attacking busy enough that they don't notice probing happening in the background. Is, 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 is that what you're talking about? Uh, because I, I know a lot of these security appliances look great on paper, but the problem is as you increase the amount of traffic, they actually have to scale back their features in order to be able to handle it. That's very true. That happened at uh, Op Israel last year. The uh, uh, DDoSing was able to obfuscate what the real attack was, and it was keeping the machines very busy and able to perform the real attacks. Uh, let's talk about that. Op Israel. I've, I've heard about this. Explain what it is and what you did. Uh, well, we didn't work directly with it, and essentially what we do is, I mean, we create events in order to prepare for such events. I mean, uh, essentially we have two houses. We create products that attack things in lab scenarios, and also we create analytics tools. And really what our analytics tools do is allow you to have insight into different applications, whether they're a DDoS or an attack or whatnot. But really on the attack side of it, we will create a DDoS in a lab. So if you have a security device, we will raise the volume of this denial of service and then have the regular apps take place and have the analytics uh, devices take place. So we're able to tell whether or not you're able to sift through the DDoS, allow the real users to do what they're supposed to be doing, and also find the attacks. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Ixia. So this is the company that you work for. Uh, both Brian and I have worked with, actually uh, all my co-hosts, Brian, Curtis, and myself, uh, we've all worked with Ixia. Ixia has always been the box that you, you probably don't buy it, you probably rent it for a while to push as much traffic through your network as possible, and, and then you can find out where it's going to break. But that's changed over the last couple of years, Ixia actually made an acquisition of a company that gave them another product that doesn't just push traffic, but it actually generates attack. Can you talk about that two-pronged approach? Why would Ixia buy an attack company when they're about generating traffic? Wow. That's an awesome question, Padre. Essentially, that's really what networks are dealing with. They're dealing with real users and the attacks at the same time. They acquired Breaking Point Systems, and Breaking Point's a company that specializes in creating a mix of attack traffic and real user traffic to find out, essentially, where the rubber meets the road, where a inline security device is able to actually identify obfuscated attacks during high volumes of realistic traffic. Okay, all right. Uh, let, let's talk about something real world here because, uh, you know, if we don't bring into the real world, my, my audience will get upset. Sony. Sony has been on everyone's mind. I mean, this last year, 2014, was really a year of some high profile attacks. Everything from Target to Home Depot and then ending the year with Sony. And Sony was really one of the most spectacular failures because as the information was coming out about how long the attack was running and how they had gotten in and exactly how much material they had they had uh, removed from the Sony network, I think people kind of realized that, wow, this, this was a network that was completely un unprepared. This is an enterprise that is supposed to know what it's doing, that's supposed to know communications, that pays millions of dollars for security, and they looked absolutely owned. Uh, what... What went wrong with Sony? Well, um, a couple things went wrong. Uh, the group, supposedly North Korea, I mean, uh, the uh, U.S. government came out stating specifically it was North Korea, did this, had been in there for about two months. And even when they were in there, they made a few, several critical mistakes. Um, they, a couple times, exposed their IP addresses. And that was something they had been careful earlier to not do. Um, more than a few things went wrong in there. And it was a very... Um, costly error to them because the people at Sony lost a lot of intellectual property, they lost a lot of credentials and logins, and uh, a lot of ways they could have uh, prevented this is had they had more breach detection and also prepared better. All right. L let's, let's take a 10,000 foot view here. If I, again, we, we run our 10,000 seat enterprise network, that's our sort of our imaginary test case. If I wanted to start doing application slash threat testing, what are some of the things 
that I should look at? What are some of the things that I should start considering? Let's not bring in specific hardware yet. Mm -hmm. Just what are what's my checklist look like? Okay, so if you're going to start doing security testing, one of the things you need to do is be able to actually create your real users and real attacks. And when you're able to create real attacks in real time, I mean, here's a, real, a very critical thing. In your 10,000 user um, enterprise network, you're making changes every day. And these changes are to firmware, you're upgrading signature sets, you're changing in uh, different tuning on your breach detection. I mean, you're making changes all the time. And these changes need to be qualified. So in terms of testing, you need to be creating these real events and you need to be doing over and over again because you need to make uh, accounts for the minutia because sometimes a small change to your network will have huge, uh, huge problems. Yeah. Uh, and one, one related question to that is we've seen in the last year or so the death of the perimeter security model. And I'm going to call it now. I'm gonna, it's dead. Uh, th it was that old notion that you could somehow have really expensive, really high-powered firewalls at the perimeter of your network. They would keep all the baddies out, and therefore you only had to worry about the traffic that was coming up to your, uh, your point of entry. That's changed. We now just assume, especially in light of the Sony attack, that the attacker is inside, that there is some advanced persistent threat running on the inside of the network. How has Ixia, along with Breaking Point, changed the way that they test networks? Because um, I remember like when we, we had an Ixia box at uh, CES that was throwing traffic around the network, around a 10 gig ring, just to show that we could throw that much traffic without anything breaking. And we had a breaking point that was throwing traffic at the firewall. I think we can't do that anymore, right? We now have to throw the attacks on the inside of the, uh, of the firewall, and we have to throw the traffic at the outside of the firewall. That's 100% true. Um, one of the things gained from the, uh, the post-op of Sony was that uh, the people had been in there for a while, and there were stolen credentials. And it's very plausible now that a, an employee could have been part of the source of that. So it's crucial now not to say that once you get past this point, you can't have the untrust and trust zone anymore. It's uh, basically all untrust now. Right. I, I want to go ahead and bring in uh, some of my co-hosts. And actually, I, I do want to welcome back into the show, he had a long, hard drive from San Francisco, Mr. Curtis Franklin. He is the uh, executive editor over at Information Week Radio. Curtis, thank you for coming in studio and uh, for making the trip. I that, that couldn't have been fun flying out of Stormageddon. Um, it, it's been an exciting day of travel to get here to the Brookhouse. Uh, started this morning in Florida, made a brief stop in scenic St. Louis, finally to San Francisco, and <laughs> now to, to the Brickhouse. But you know what? All those miles are worth it just to be here with, with everyone on the Twyatt crew. Well, Chevert and uh, Curtis, I, I want to throw one question over to you before we take a break. And then we're gonna, when we come back, we're actually going to have Phil take us through what Ixia does for application slash threat testing. But before that, l let's talk about that, that question of perimeter security. Oh, we've got a couple of people in the uh, chat room, like Synac, who's saying, wait a minute, the, the perimeter is dead? What, what exactly does that mean? When, when you try to talk to executives on your radio show, how do you explain to them that the perimeter is no longer the security model that they should be following? Uh, Curtis, let's start with you. You know, the analogy that I use is the analogy of the gate crossing at a railroad crossing. You know, it's something that you know should be there, and you know that in theory it should work and protect you, but the fact is that you really need to go ahead, slow down, and look both ways when you approach a railroad crossing just in case it doesn't work. Well, I think that we've reached the point where we're going to have to assume that the perimeter security is porous. Will it keep out the low-level people? Will it slow down some of the attacks? Absolutely. And is there a requirement from a regulatory and insurance point of view that you have them in place? No question. But should you count on that keeping your network safe? No way. I think the only reasonable thing to do is assume that your perimeter is being breached pretty much each and every day. Right, right. And actually, uh, Firehawk said, look, perimeter security is like having a moat. And yeah, it's fine as long as it works, but you have to assume that something has gotten past the moat. So Sin to answer your question, Sinak, in the chat room, who wants to know, well, does that mean we get rid of the perimeter? No. As Curtis said, you keep your firewalls, you make sure that they're top of the line, you make sure that they're updated, you make sure that they're watching for the right types of attacks. 
but you also have to assume that you've got advanced persistent threats on the inside of the network. Chibert, let me throw over to you. This is kind of a nightmare scenario for a lot of IT people because when you look at something like the Sony breach, a good non-perimeter security model would not have just been looking at the incoming traffic. It would have been looking at the outgoing traffic and it would have said, wait a minute, why are there terabytes of data flowing out of my network? And, and that's, that would actually be a really good example of, of concrete difference between perimeter and non-perimeter security, right? Yeah, actually, um, I've been on this soapbox for, God, maybe a decade. I've been saying you shouldn't only have a trusted and untrusted anymore. You need to have zones. You need to have, instead of just a moat, you need to have guards between different sections. So our Target and Home Depot examples, um, they had the point of sale and general use machines in the same zone. What really should have happened is you use this more as an opportunity for upgrades, an upgrade path. So when I ran my big firewall test using, oh, by the way, Ixia gear, I actually ran the configuration for attacks between zones. How well did the firewall stop them? I ran the attacks assuming that little Johnny has brought in an infected laptop and is using it in his dad's office. And now that infected laptop is behind the firewall. What happens when you have zones? Most modern firewalls, you know, an enterprise grade firewall has the ability to create lots and lots of zones sitting on VLANs. Use them. It's not that hard to set up and it provides you a nice upgrade path towards software defined networks because software defined networks now starts making it dramatically easier to be able to examine traffic coming from many, many different zones and have full packet inspection Use it as an upgrade path. Use it as an excuse to start moving in this direction. No longer just a trusted and untrusted. You need to actually have more zones, take a good hard look at it, make use of the features in your current firewalls so that when you go to SDN, it won't be a massive upgrade. Yeah, that's the compartmentalization that, uh, that you know a lot of security experts are calling for now. That would have stopped the breach at Sony, it would have stopped at Colt because the problem with the Sony breach was once they got past that perimeter, they could basically move around the entire network. And, you know, more as again, as more of the details are coming out, they're realizing the breach affected not just the computers holding data, but the computers holding archive data about employees and even like the cafeteria network. Uh, that's that's the kind of, of security that we're looking for. Rorks is saying, but does that mean you don't trust your employees? Who can you trust if you can't trust your employees? But I think what we're really trying to say is you have to assume that someone in your network is going to do something stupid. It's, I mean, especially if you run a major network with more than a thousand users, someone at some point is going to click an attachment they shouldn't have, is going to bring in a notebook from home that's been infected, is going to plug in a tablet and do something really ridiculous and demand access to files they shouldn't have access to. And you need to have a way to fix that. I, I want to leave uh, Phil with the last question before we move over to break. Phil, we've got uh, questions in the chat room about uh, honeypots. Uh, does, do honeypots play any, any uh, role in this, this new world of non-perimeter security? I mean, honeypots have been around for a while, and, and they're an excellent tool for gathering new and current attacks. Um, in terms of what took place at Sony, I mean, I think our previous discussion really kind of handles that. I mean, it was effective spear phishing was one of the uh, the, mm. the ways that they, they got in. So I, I really don't think a honeypot would have saved Sony, but, I mean, maybe some education and testing and preparation in order to, I mean, like you said before, Padre, if uh, someone clicks on that, even you put all these policies into place, it's still going to be breached. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, I know, I know people are kind of wrangling at this of, wait a minute, we have to be able to trust somebody. Well, no, we really don't. It's a, it's a much bigger pain for the administrator to, to not trust everyone, but we are at the point where you can't assume that there's a safe zone in your network to which everyone should have access. That's it's kind of strange. Now, when we come back, we're going to go in-depth on what Ixia can bring to the game. But first, let's go ahead and thank the third sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Ring Central. It's strange, but, you know, the last thing that a lot of startups and SMBs think about is their phone system, even though for many, it's the first point of presence for their customers. There are too many people for whom that office system is an afterthought. 
Even though a professional-sounding phone system might be a customer's first real interaction, they just don't understand that you need to put the, the resources into making sure that that's just as good as your website. That's why we're happy to have RingCentral back as a sponsor of the Twiat Riot. They bring all of your phone systems together. Phone, fa fax, text, conference calling, and now high-def video uh, meetings, all into one package that works seamlessly in the cloud and sounds professional. Uh, we love doing things in the cloud here at Twit, and we love Ring Central. We didn't want a clunky PBX system taking up space in the basement with fewer features than my smartphone. Besides, have you ever tried to configure one of those things? It's impossible. We wanted a communication stack that would complement what we do. A Ring Central connects to all of your offices and all your workers together in one system. It puts your smartphone to work. Ring Central integrates with both iOS and Android devices so your team can stay connected from anywhere at any time. You can even make calls from your PC. You can easily customize your system from a web browser or from their mobile apps. It lets you save time, money, and all the hassles of maintaining your own PBX phone system. Your calls are encrypted and private with Secure Voice, so you don't ever have to worry about the details of your calls leaking out. And your current phone number is valuable. They understand that. Ring Central lets you keep your existing numbers, use toll-free numbers, local extensions, and even vanity numbers. There are so many features like shared lines, call parking, paging, advanced call forwarding, flexible answering, rules, call log reports. I, I just don't have time to go into them all. I, I think the only thing we can do is to tell you to try it. It's it's got free 24-7 customer support, so once you get involved with Ring Central, they'll answer all your questions about how to make it work for you. There are no setup fees and no activation fees. Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Ring Central. Ring Central starts under $25 a month per user, and you can start right now with a 30-day risk-free trial. Plus, there's a special offer for Twit listeners. For every desk phone you buy, you get a second phone free, up to 20 phones. Visit ringcentral.com or call 800-543-9980 and use the promo code TWIT. Ring Central. Get connected in the cloud professionally now. And we thank Ring Central for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Let's get back to it. Phil, I think we've just uh, scared a couple of people. We've given them the nightmare scenario. We've told them that their perimeter security is no longer worthy of their network. So how are you going to fix it? Let's, let's, let's dive into what Ixia has brought to the game. Okay, great. Uh, could I show my screen? Okay, great. I'm going to go through just a couple slides. I promise that I'm not going to bore everyone with dozens of slides and going into the minutiae through that because I think I have some interesting content, so I really want to make it relevant to our topic of conversation, but also talk about how Ixia solves this unique problem. Now, one thing I talked about earlier was how a breach detection system, an inline security device, these content-aware devices have to be agnostic. They really need to look at all the traffic, and they really can't assume they live in a pristine environment or an environment of pure exploits. So right here, you can see different network traffic going through there. We absolutely have to deal all of it as if it's potentially malicious. Here are three scenarios right here that show what a security device actually blocking something would look like. Um, if people have seen my presentation before, I always have PCAPs in them. If I don't see it on the wire, I don't believe it's real. <laughs> so in the, in the very first one, it shows someone making a socket connection and someone trying to execute something they shouldn't be able to do. And this very top one is from the untrust side. You can see that it was blocked. If you look at the exact same traffic from the server side, the line right here, this packet number six, never made it across the network. It was immediately reset. Now, let's say, for example, we add some obfuscation, or if traffic volumes reach too high, all of a sudden now, the exploit goes through. Here, I use some different encoding to get the traffic to go through, because whatever regular expression or a method they were using to identify traffic wasn't effective. Another piece of information that really ties into why testing is crucial is this slide right here. I mean, chipsets have gotten so fast now that a laptop is capable of creating some real damage. What I really want you to look at is the bottom left-hand corner. This is one second of Wireshark capture. This is a DDoS I wrote in C, a very simple DDoS, and I've got 12,000 packets in one second. So the gone are the days where you need thousands to hundreds of thousands of nodes in a botnet to create real damage. I mean, this is an older laptop. It's really not a very powerful system, and being able to create 12,000 atta uh, DDoS attacks in a single second is pretty impressive. So getting into really how we solve this problem. 
Ixia is a security resilience company. We really have two houses, one where we generate these real security events, and we'll really give you insight as to how effective a network is, and that's every aspect of the network, the entire infrastructure, the security devices, everything. We'll be able to tell you really where the rubber meets the road with respect to being able to handle real users during security events. We have a second side of the equation, which we're also going to talk about, is our visibility. Um, Ixia really understands application layer protocols. It's really where we've invested a lot of our energy into, and we understand them to such a point that we generate these uh, attacks and traffic natively. So right here shows one of our products. We are able to create the clients and the servers of millions and millions of users running hundreds of different application layer protocols and to, up to nearly a terabit of traffic. So move a little further on. Application threat intelligence is something that we really excel at. We're able to utilize, we have 6,000 different attacks, 35,000 pieces of malware, and we can use evasion on them, we have DDoS. We're able to take all these things and put them out the same pipe at the same time. If you're making or deploying a security service, I mean, let's say, for example, you are Padre's 10,000-seat enterprise company. How well can you actually defend against attacks? And we've already established that they're going to take place. It's not a if, but a when. Being able, in an enterprise scenario, to constantly test against these and constantly expose your security measures to real attacks that change every two weeks, it's a very powerful tool. Really what we do here is we allow people to have effective risk management. We're able to create these attacks and the user traffic at the same time and show whether your risk management model is still working. And for an enterprise, being able to conclusively say to your um, chief security officer whether or not changes you're making to your security is working or whether it broke your whole system is a crucial thing to be able to do. A second thing that we do is visibility. Uh, Ixia is really good at not only generating the protocols and the attacks, but also understanding them on the wire. That's why we took the inverse of our application and threat intelligence program and create a product that listens to network traffic and deciphers it. And this would have been a very useful thing had Sony been uh, utilizing a product such as Ixia Visibility. We'd be able to really look deep into the wire and uh, look at geolocation. For example, um, one of the things that happened was the people who breached Sony exposed their IP addresses a few times. Wouldn't it be very interesting in your enterprise network to say, hey, someone in this ring is talking to China or North Korea? or at least their IP address space. It would be a very critical thing to know. Or not even something that uh, precise. What if they're just talking to a Tor exit node? What if someone in your software development ring is not only talking to Salesforce or your source safe, but also part of a Tor exit node? It's really not something that we want to have take place. If I come over to here. On this screen right here, this is live traffic being run out of Ixia's Breaking Point solution. Breaking Point is our flagship product for generating real network traffic from real users and security events at the same time. You can see here applications are running. We have Oracle. We have some Asian chat protocols. We have BitTorrent, server message blocks, Oracle. All this is being generated. We are both the client and the server, and we can create this at up to a terabit of traffic in a single chassis, and further if you absolutely need to. At the exact same time, we're running attacks. Right now, I've run 2,300 attacks to the system since our conversation started. And all this is happening from the same users, and if there was an inline device there, it would be exposed to these, and we'll tell you definitively whether it can stop these attacks. It's an incredibly powerful thing. I mean, the alternative to this is to set up a bunch of servers on your own and run this traffic via a couple shell accounts, and it wouldn't really be the same level of analytics, and also, it wouldn't be the same volume of traffic, and representing the same volume is a very key thing. At the exact same time, I have our application and threat intelligent processor analyzing all the traffic. One of the greatest things we do with this is geolocation. I mentioned before, it's crucial to know not only what application layer protocol is running on your network and whether attacks are taking place, but whom they're talking to. You can see here that I have the United States highlighted, but also have traffic going to China. And it's a very crucial thing to know at the same time. Also, we have a thing called dynamic application understanding, where we're able to look and find new applications. People write apps all the time. It's not just going to be BitTorrent and Oracle and YouTube. It's going to be something someone wrote that's an embedded web application. And being able to understand those is a very crucial, crucial aspect of knowing your network. So that's essentially what Ixia does for enterprise security at a very high level. We're able to create these events and tell you whether or not 
the network that you've deployed and are currently maintaining is able to continue effectively enforcing your security policies. And also on the visibility side, we can be deployed in your enterprise network and take that same intelligence that we have and be able to understand what's happening and really correlate all those events for you. So it's kind of both the yin and the yang of being able to work in the enterprise network security space. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to throw over to Curtis. Curtis, you know, one of the things that happens a lot whenever you start talking about Ixia gear, because let's let's all be honest, Ixia gear, gear is it is expensive. It's incredibly good. It's incredibly powerful, but it's expensive. So when you speak to your executive audience and you start explaining that, you know, when your IT guy comes up to you and says, look, we need a breaking point box, we need an Ixia traffic generator because we need to test the claims of the vendors who sold us all this hardware and told us it would be perfect. They sometimes say, well, I mean, can't we just trust the specs? Why, you know, are, are we finally at a point where we can trust but verify that the hardware is going to work as, as advertised? Well, I think the whole question is whether you are testing the claims once or you're going to be testing your system on, a, on an ongoing basis. If all you want to do is test once, then you're right. They are dreadfully expensive answers to that problem. What you probably want to do is work with some lab somewhere to run the custom tests for you because they will eat the cost of investing in the hardware and then they'll amortize that over a bunch of customers. What we're seeing more and more enterprises do though is test their hardware scenarios on an ongoing basis because they recognize that they're under ongoing attack. Now, if, you, if you're using it on a regular basis, then all of a sudden that expense starts evening out over time. That's really the question. Is this a one-time thing that you're doing, or is it part of your continuous improvement of your security? If it's the latter, then an Ixia box suddenly, it still will make you cringe to write that first check, but it makes a lot more sense over the long, long haul. Chibert, you, you do this for a living. I mean, you blow up boxes. You've used Ixia traffic generators. You've, you've used a breaking point box to really, really hammer at security products. We can't just test once anymore, right? I mean, that's, that's, that was the popular way to do it. You, you rented the Ixia box so that you could rate your network for X a number of packets per second, X a number of operations per second, and you could test your firewall to make sure that, oh, it's not going to let anything through. But if you're not doing constant testing, you're no longer doing due diligence. Yeah, you know, the reality is, is you, you're constantly making changes to your network. What's to say someone doesn't make a mistake? Being able to confirm that that switch upgrade you did still can pass VoIP traffic um, to be ready for that mission critical thing like registration or something is a pretty big deal. Now, I will send out one thing. Ixia tools are not expensive. You can get the breaking point and the testing device testing tools in a virtual machine. And with the speed of the new machines out there, you can actually do quite a bit of testing. So what I would suggest to people considering is put it in your budget for the VMs. You know, get a copy of Chariot so that you can go and confirm a mesh type arrangement. You're, Simulate your traffic in the off hours so that you don't drive your users crazy. Do your testing on a regular basis, and when you do a big upgrade, rent the expensive gear for that so you can really ramp it up. It's not expensive, especially when you consider the cost of what this costs, the reputation for people like Sony, Home Depot, and Target. Well, let's go ahead and talk about costs with our Ixia expert since we brought him all the way over here. Phil... This this is a common thing that I hear a lot, which is, oh, I'd like an Ixia box, but I just can't get it. But is Tibert right? Could could I could I get a VM? Could I get a VM and and run those those intermittent tests? And then when I need to do a big test, when I've done a major deployment, that's when I go ahead and rent one of the big boys. Well, I mean, Ixia has a lot of solutions that allow you to right size what you need for your network testing. I mean, we're absolutely coming out with a with a uh, virtualized solution, but also, I mean, we've been focusing on enterprise now for some time. And uh, we have a product called the Perfect Storm One. It's a box that'll do up to 80 gig of traffic, but if you want to, you can turn on only four gig of it and just pay a much smaller amount 
and grow as you need it. So, I mean, we focus a lot on enterprise and their needs, but one of the things that, uh, that Brian mentioned, which is very, very crucial, is that the price of a solution isn't uh, nearly as bad as not, per not performing this kind of testing and having, I mean, if Sony could have written a check beforehand to prevent this breach, I'm sure <laughs> they absolutely would have. Uh, I mean, it's the uh, ounce of prevention, pound of cure scenario, and we feel very much that performing uh, proactive measures is always better than doing damage control. Yeah, security measures always sound expensive until it was too late to use the security measures. Uh, we're, we're actually out of time here. I, I do want to have one last go around. Uh, again, uh, let's start with you, Curtis. Uh, in speaking to, to the executive crowd, that's, that's your audience, what, what kind of knowledge would you want them to take away from a sit down with Ixia or a sit down with any security vendor about spending the money to actually stress test your system and see where the holes are? Well, I think that, that Chebert actually hit the nail on the head. You really have to judge the cost of the security solution, what, whatever that may be, against the cost of not having it. Uh, Sony has been an incredibly valuable object lesson for the rest of the industry. Um, you know, as we've heard, if they could have written a very large check to avoid this, they would have done so in a heartbeat. I think a lot more companies are going to be looking at making that same kind of investment in the future. The question is, like insurance, you hate writing that insurance check, and in a sense you feel like you're betting against yourself. Here I'm writing this check, and the only way I win the money back is if something terrible happens to me. Well, security is, is a little bit like that. The only way you know that you've won is if you feel like you've wasted all your money on security because you haven't had an attack. Still, spending the money makes sense. And for most of our executives now, we have regulatory hammers making sure that they're willing to make those investments. Chibert, let me go over to you. If, if we've got a young IT person who wants to learn the best practices for stress testing his or her new network, what would be the path that you would give them? So they start out with the uh, IX chariot. Where do they go? What, what tools do they play with? What do they try to, to learn so that by the time they get the backing to, to buy one of the big boxes, they actually understand what to do with it? Well, the whole idea is putting yourself into the what if scenario. I usually tell people instead of trying to justify it for, you know, preventing an attack, that's always tough to do with the bean counters. Tell them you're trying to use it so you can create simulations so that, say, for instance, you're getting ready to do an upgrade with a new sparkly new distribution switch. Well, instead of trusting the salesman, we all know how trustworthy salesmen can be. Why don't you go and validate it? Make sure it actually will run because if you go and spend, you know, six or seven digits to go and upgrade all your distribution switches and it breaks the VoIP infrastructure, you're going to be looking for a new job. But if you've done due diligence and you've done the testing, then all of a sudden bean counters tend to be a little more forgiving because you say, hey, we've actually got these numbers. It does work. This is what now we've got a you know, a direction to look, okay, maybe, just maybe, something's wrong with the VoIP infrastructure rather than the switches. The whole idea, why we use it on interop is make sure your infrastructure is as bulletproof as possible so you can eliminate the things to look at. It also means you now have the tools that if you're going to roll out VLANs, how fast are the VLAN processors on those switches? Can it handle the segmentation? Is your firewall fast enough to be able to handle 30 or 40 zones? Um, that's, that's really what makes the difference between your El Cheapo firewall and your enterprise-grade firewall. And as we start moving into SDN, SDN isn't going to be implemented evenly. There's going to be issues because keep in mind, Cisco and a lot of the other big boys have software-based features and they have fast path-based features that are optimized into the lower levels of the switch. So go and confirm it. Just because the feature's there doesn't mean it's going to be exactly how the sales guy tells you it's going to work. Confirm, verify, test, because if it blows up in your face and you haven't, 
go look for a new job. Phil, last word to you, hearing what both Curtis and Chibert have said. Uh, what what wisdom do you want to impart on the uh, the member of the Dwight White listening today, wondering whether or not he or she is going to start testing their network, what kind of gear they're going to get, what kind of products they're going to use to, to uh, test throughput and uh, uh, threat readiness? You know, Brian made some great points. I really want to hammer on a few of those, um, one of them being that your network is in constant flux. You're expanding it. You're making changes to it. There are security concerns. There are also performance concerns. And, I mean, math on the back of, uh, on the back of a napkin is really never going to get you what you need to do. If you don't diligently test both the security and performance aspects of this network, then you're really opening yourself up to the possibility that not only security events will take place, but also that performance will go down and that you'll have network downtime. And in a lot of cases with enterprise companies, that can be incredibly expensive and incredibly costly. And as Brian mentioned, it could cost you your job. So um, I highly recommend invoking a policy of security resilience, testing, and working with a company that's able to create your actual network events and security events at the same time. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for being part of this panel. This has been a lot of fun. This is, I mean, this has been way too much material to, to stick into 30 minutes. But uh, you know what? We're going to have to bring you back. Phil, let's start with you because they've just listened to the best dang enterprise podcast in the world. That's according to 9 out of 10 DDoSs. Where can they find you? Where can they find out more information about Ixia, about the work that you do, and about the products that you represent? Well, on um, www.ixacom.com is uh, our company's website. I mean, we have offices all over the world. We're a publicly traded company. Um, our main offices are in Santa Clara and in Los Angeles. And I mentioned before that we have solutions that range all the way from layer two up to layer seven, focusing on applications and security. We also, the inverse of that, we have visibility solutions that involve the um, analysis of not only security and application events, but also we do packet brokering and all sorts of different things in order to really gain insight into what your network's doing. Well, Phil, I, I want to have you back on the show, but I believe we're going to request that you actually join Chebert at his lab because he has a 100 gig pipe wow. and uh, you could probably do a few things with the Geek in Paradise. That sounds like fun. <laughs> Let's do that. Also, and I have Ixia gear. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Brian's got some Ixia gear. Uh, but by the way, Brian, as long as we're on you, where does the Twilight Riot find you this next week? I am still hiding, still trying to get my book written, but I'm actually redesigning a s entire neighborhood of power sensors so that we can go and get a much better idea on how well smart grids work with a combination of both um, regular utilities and PV mixed in with just a little bit of wind. Ought to be interesting. I love the wind. And uh, finally, Curtis Franklin, your Skype connection looks incredible today. It's, it's a, super clear. It's amazing what a good Skype connection will do for you, isn't it? <laughs> it's simply astounding. I, I want to thank you for, for making the mad rush up to the Brick House and for, you know, for, for joining us. You could, have, you could have given up, but you, you stayed with it. Thank you so much. It's, it's great to see you in person. Uh, tell us where they can find you and what are you covering on Information Week Radio this week? Well, it's a pleasure. It's, a, it's an exciting week for me because I'm out here in the Bay Area because of the first engineering meetings for InteropNet. Uh, we're starting the meetings to put uh, InteropNet together for Interop uh, 2015. Tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, that's noon Pacific, we've got Interop Radio, and I'm excited about our guest. We've got Tanaya Hurst, a maker who's featured in a, a big article in the current issue of Make Magazine. We're going to be talking about a report from Intel on how the making movement is bringing more women into IT. Then on Friday, we've got a special uh, edition of Information Week Radio. You know, yesterday was the 100th anniversary of the first transcontinental telephone call. So on Friday, we're going to have the archivist of AT&T on Information Week Radio to talk a bit about the history of telephones, the history of telephone instruments, and maybe, just maybe, what's coming up. Again, that's 3 p.m. Eastern noon Pacific. You can find out all the URLs and everything else if you follow me on Twitter. That's KG4GWA. Curtis, Chebert, Phil, thank you very much for being part of this episode. Gentlemen, I salute you. Now, I also want to thank you. That's right, the person who watches live or downloads every episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. We couldn't do the show without you. In fact, it 
be kind of strange to do it without an audience. And so we want to do something for you. We want to make it easier for you to get the show automatically on your device of choice. Just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all of our episodes, our entire back catalog, all 126 as of this episode, so that you could find out what we've been doing in the past, our show notes, as well as a little drop-down menu that will give you options for getting it automatically into your device of choice, your iPhone, your iPad, your Android tablet, your laptop, your desktop, Mac, PC, whatever it may be, in whatever file format you want. It's one of the things we do because we love you. Also, don't forget that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. If you go there, you'll find out what we're going to be doing on every episode of every show that I do on the Twit TV network. That includes Twiet on Mondays, Padre's Corner on Tuesdays, and Coding 101 and Know How on Thursdays. Follow me and see what the digital Jesuit does when he's not in front of the camera. Also, don't forget that you could watch us live every 2.30 at Monday. That should be reversed, but I'm just going to let it go. You can go to live.twit.tv and see the pre-show, the post-show, and all the things that go in between, including the bloopers that we cut out of the final reel. Go ahead and join us, and as long as you're going to join us live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. There you'll find a, just a list of just really brilliant folks, some, some good jokesters, a couple of trolls, but mostly people who really like enterprise tech. And you, you can see me during the show pulling questions right out of the chat room. You guys are right up there, and uh, you're kind of my external brain. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and just remember, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.